interpolation. And uh, some of the elements involved in very simple uh, point processes. In geostatistical interpolation, then we use several packages uh, in, in the uh, handling of point processes. We most, mostly use uh, SPATSTAT. SPATSTAT is also backed up by a, 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 a very comprehensive book, uh, but development in SPATSTAT has advanced substantially, substantially since since the book was uh, was completed as well, particularly with regard to processes on linear networks. Um, initially, point processes were considered as taking place on a planar surface, but now uh, point processes on linear networks are also uh, be, being studied um, uh, much more intensively. There are further features which, which are being handled with regard to the development of point processes as well. Uh, with regard to uh, um, geostatistical interpolation, uh, I'll also approach but not, uh, but not go into any detail on uh, the use of standard-ish uh, machine learning techniques for, for geostatistical interpolation. This is developing but it's an area which is, uh, as you'll see, is, is not immediately obvious. So there's no one-size-fits-all approach to, 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 to doing this. So, uh, first interpolation, and I'll, I, I need to keep to time because I'm chairing a seminar at, uh, at 11.30, so I need to be, be out of here by quarter past 11. And then I'll be back again at 12.30. For the, for the two presentations and then the surgery uh, after that. So what is interpolation? Uh, what's it require with regard to data observations, prediction locations? Now, the, uh, the logic of um, a geostatistical approach or a creaking approach uh, to uh, continuous uh, surfaces or possibly continuous volumes in in three dimensions is that uh, one has a number of samples, uh, they could be bore cores, they could be soil samples, and one wishes to uh, um, obtain some um, estimate of the, uh, of the values of, that were observed at the samples for other locations for which we have no samples. So that this is, is, is filling in data where, where uh, where um, the data have not been observed. Uh, this can also be extended to filling in uh, remote sensing imagery or, or uh, earth observation imagery, uh, where there are dropouts, where, where there are, um, the signal was lost for a particular collection of pixels, or, or, or also for filling in uh, clouds. But cloud fill-in can be handled in other ways as well. So the, what we what we approach in geostatistics is um, that we're most interested in uh, making predictions for uh, unobserved locations, uh, given variables that we know about. Co-kriging, so that's, that's kriging is when we're interested in one variable. Co-kriging would be when we we have a, a multivariate setting, uh, which may also have differing support. Uh, and it's also possible then to, to, to extend this to block kriging, where we're interested in making predictions not for a single point, but for a, for a polygonal uh, unit. Um, the focus in geostatistics is very little on understanding the process. If one includes covariates, the focus is not on the coefficients of the covariates. Yesterday, when I was, talk when I was talking about uh, spatial regression modeling, then most of the focus or very much of the focus in those disciplines that would be in ecology or uh, the social sciences is on the the coefficients of the model. In geostatistics, the, the covariates, if, if there are covariates or linear trends or other trends in the, in the data, are uh, not the focus of interest. So the focus, focus of interest is to get uh, predictions which fit well 
and which do not um, suffer from degradations with regard to prediction standard error. So that would be the focus in geostatistics that we're interested in in, in, in making these predictions from, from some sample data. And it's then assumed that the samples are well chosen or the locations of the samples are well chosen with regard to the variability of, of, of the data sets. It's also possible to interpolate deterministically and, determinist, uh, and also mention deterministic uh, um, interpolation. And I, in, in fact, some deterministic interpolation is, it's not bad. So that, that, that you, you simply smooth over a surface uh, and, and you get, you get uh, predictions, say from points to a grid, which are okay. If you go to, say, the, uh, the uh, Akima package uh, and now um, uh, a replacement for the uh, Akima package, um, that was what it was doing. It was taking points and uh, deterministically uh, interpolating. Techniques for doing deterministic interpolation have existed for a very long time, about 200 years, uh, where the, the idea being that if you draw triangles between the points, then you can, you can find the gradient of the, of the line. Um, so if you take the, 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 in quotation marks, the height of the observation at a two-dimensional point, the height is the value of the vari variable of, of interest. And so if, if we've got a high level, say, of, of um, um, PCBs in sediments here and a low value there, and you draw a straight line between them, and then you chop it up <laughs> into, into regular bits, and you can draw contours, and, and that's a deterministic. So using a triangulation between the points is, is where you're coming from with Akima. And you, instead of just using a, uh, a straight line, you can also fit a, 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 a spline surface, which, is, which it would then be deterministic given the, uh, the um, uh, arguments you're using to the spline fitting procedure or the te technology which, which underlies the spine, spline uh, fitting, fitting procedure. So deterministic is also possible and, and actually in some cases it works quite well and it's also possible to mix deterministic and uh, so that using um, uh, instead of calling splines splines you could call them radial base approaches and then what you're estimating are the arguments which uh, an analyst might have given in a purely deterministic setting the the, the analyst is controlling the, the 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 degree of slackness of the spline, the the extent to which it will it will follow uh, obvious drop offs between points, or whether it's tauter, uh, so that the the tension in the spline could then also be fitted as a parameter, and then so that you can you can estimate that as well. Uh, so prediction is important. You then get to a uh, a. a a series of uh, results uh, mostly reached at, at uh, Lancaster University about 20 years ago with regard to uh, model-based geostatistics. So there's a book by uh, Peter Diggle and Paolo Ribeiro on model-based geostatistics. Uh, and I'll explain as we go on what the difference between model-based geostatistics, which would include Bayesian geostatistics, and uh, conventional uh, geostatistics uh, is. Uh, what one's trying to do is to make uh, good guesses of the possible values of the variable of interest for places where there are no observations. So that, that's, that, that's the basic framework. Um, these would be based on the relative positions of the places uh, where we have the observations and the places where we need the predictions. Very often the Places are uh, points distributed irregularly across the, the, the study area, and very often the, the locations uh, at which predictions are required are a, a regular grid. So you're trying to make a, a regular grid surface from, from the points that you have, have available. Uh, however, very often when you're interpolating to a grid, you say, okay, we don't really need to do block uh, prediction for all of the surface of the grid 
and then average over that. We just take the the center of the of the of the grid cell that we're going for and say okay, so we do it that way. That 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 is that is fairly typical. Uh, there are underlying assumptions uh, for interpolation, uh, and uh, one of these is the dis uh, distribution of the of the data. So that very often we're dealing with uh, with a normal distribution of a continuous variable. If the variable is not normally distributed, uh, then a log normal distribution or some transformation of the variable may be called for. But that this then leads to the fact that we've transformed the variable of interest. We make the predictions in the scale of the transformed variable of interest, and we need to back transform to get back to the actual the actual prediction values, which then mean that the means that the standard errors of the predictions, when you back transformed, will probably, in 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 a in a, in, a, in a number of cases, will not no longer be symmetric. So that in the transformed scale, the standard error around each of the predictions would be would be symmetric. But if you back transform, then the, the, it won't be symmetric anymore. So that representing the uncertainty becomes becomes uh, more of a problem. The standard model assumes planar, uh, uh, planar uh, geometry, error-free coordinates, uh, and error-free uh, covariates, and that the data are ob observed as directly as possible from the same gen uh, realization of, uh, of the data generating process, so that, that you, you don't want to mix samples taken from completely different uh, survey uh, rounds because they, they, they will have been subject to other uh, covariate uh, influence. So you say that, say that you have data which are from uh, spring and autumn, then probably, probably the, there's, there's going to be a difference between them. So you want, want to, to try to be as homogenous as, uh, uh, as you can. And uh, in exactly the same way that I described yesterday, the, the process is, is that uh, we have uh, we have, but well, perhaps a more honest process. We have the data, uh, so that probably something is waiting for me. Now, I can see something on this, but I can't see it here, so I'm not quite sure what that's doing. So perhaps, uh, perhaps I need to select a pen here. And I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Um, yes, this is really stupid. Um, anyway, it's it probably there's an alert somewhere which I can't see on one of the one of the. Sorry. Uh, maybe that might be an idea. Uh, because it, it is displaying on this one, but it's not displaying there. It's at the moment it appears to be on this one. Yeah, and you have three there, so there are two different monitors. Um, the, is that the three? Let's see. Or can I m choose a different one here? Can I choose this one? I, I changed to two now, but it's still not drawing. Ah, I think I think we've got something now. Yep. Does that look right to you? So the reason is that you have. I had this a, is the screen you had it on. Yeah. It says monitor one. Yeah. But we were on monitor three. Okay. Okay. So okay. So that now, hopefully. We're okay. Yeah, yesterday, you recall that I wrote that data is smooth plus, and then there was the spatial which in the geostatistical case would usually, the standard geostatistical case is based on the variogram. Uh, 
But geostatistics, unlike uh, spatial regression in the lattice sense, acknowledges the fact that there may be unobservable spatial regularity, which is present in the rough, but is too small to be observed given the spacing of the samples. So that if we had denser samples, we'd be able to pick up more of the small scale variation. Uh, given the scale, so that the, those are the standard components. This may be just the intercept, or it may include, uh, it may include covariates. Uh, on occasion, this would be called uh, um, uh, um, a model with external drift, because the covariates in uh, many earlier uh, geostatistical uh, um, uh, constructions uh, were simply a, uh, a li linear or quadratic surface so that that if the intercept the intercepts assuming that that the the values are exactly the same over the whole surface with variability but maybe there's a there's a linear or quadratic or cubic trend and very often one would then include the trend as covariates but it's also possible to include arbitrary variables or, or uh, factors as, as covariates um, in, 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 in uh, uh, carrying out the construction of the model which is then going to be used for, uh, for prediction. Um, the uh, specific difference between uh, between conventional geostatistics and model-based geostatistics is that when one fits the variogram model, the fit is not exact. So that there's error involved in the parameters or fitting the, the coefficients of the variogram model. And in model-based geostatistics, this, uh, this error is carried through into the fit of the model itself. So that the standard errors of prediction generated from the model reflect the fact that these coefficients are a distribution and so that in it's a, if you sample from the distribution of these values if the distribution is well behaved and quite tight then you get a result which is very similar to conventional geostatistics which assumes that there's no variability in these that they're fixed but if you accept that there are that there's a distribution then more uh, uh, so this variability will be transfer into the variability. The predictions will be similar or the same for the center of the distribution. However, you get a better picture of the variability of the predictions uh, from the model for new locations um, because you're taking account of the uncertainty present in fitting the variogram model. Uh, if there's more, so the more error there is uh, to be fed through, whether it's um, uh, measurement error, positional error, or error in fitting the smooth, the more you probably need to, uh, to move towards uh, hierarchical spatial models or Bayesian spatial models, possibly using uh, uh, MCMC. So the model-based geostatistics um, are... Um, uh, probably to be recommended in in general terms, uh, rather than uh, rather than uh, than staying with conventional. However, if the analyst can reasonably assume that it's not going to make a big difference, that we've got a really good fit on the variogram model, and we really believe that the positions are measured accurately and the measures uh, of the variable of interest are accurate. Then, then probably there isn't going to be an enormous difference uh, between the, the uh, output prediction maps from uh, conventional geostatistics and model-based geostatistics. If, however, one wants, to, uh, one wants to try to be as honest as possible about the uncertainty, then model-based geostatistics will, 
which probably then means uh, Bayesian geostatistics. There are there are a number of packages which I, I'm not touching on here, such as SP Bayes, uh, which are excellent. SP Bayes is associated with uh, with a, a textbook, which is in the second edition, and um, there are similar approaches in the fields uh, uh, package, which is a, another excellent uh, geostatistical uh, package. But here, here we'll be we'll we'll be staying with with um, uh, mostly with GSTAT and GOR. Uh, one of the ways of handling interpolation is deterministically, and inverse distance weighting is a typical approach to this. So that inverse distance weighting would say that uh, we expect that the uh, the variability between observations will vary with the inverse of the distance between the uh, sampling locations. So if the sampling locations are close to each other, we'd expect the differences to be very small, uh, and that we would expect them the differences to grow uh, with increasing distance. This is a standard geostatistical approach. But then inverse distance weighting says that, well, since, since we know something about this, we can have a power parameter on the distance. So we're dividing, you know, so we've got uh, one divided by the distance to a power, and the power is then uh, a, uh, a parameter which either the analyst sets and say distance squared, or we can uh, um, attempt to see which power gives us the best uh, best fit. Um, we could also just use a trend surface. We could say it looks as though there appears to be a very strong trend, and maybe once we fitted the trend, there's no more story in the residuals from the fitted trend model. So we would then just go. The data is like the smooth, and we, if we see that the smooth is a is a is a is a um, uh, a trend, then we could do that as well. We just just that that's in a sense not deterministic because it's also a statistical model, but it's not attempting to model uh, spatial autocorrelation in the residuals. Just saying we're dealing here with a trend. This would be a little bit like time series modeling, where you take a, a, a view on what the, the say, um, um, variations through the week or variations between seasons would be, and you just say, well, we filter by that because we know definitely that, that that's that that's that's the way things the way things apply. Splines can also have a statistical in, uh, interpretation. That's true, but they're most often used deterministically. But in the same way as with uh, inverse distance, di inverse uh, distance weighting and trend surfaces, you can choose the the, the fitted model by cross validation. So that so that both for inverse distance weighting, so you can choose the power on the distance by cross validation. With trends, you can again say what power do we need here uh, for for the for, do we want to go for a cubic surface. What what's going to perform best for us, and then then uh, handle it that way, and cross validation can also be applied to to splines, so that searching over a, a limited domain of uh, parameters for for the spline fitting. Uh, it's also possible to fit uh, a spatial sp uh, statistical models with covariates, and and also then predict for locations, so that in the first. Uh, uh, MGCV book, uh, there was a nice fisheries application doing more or less exactly exactly this. It was showing where one would expect to find uh, uh, denser um, observations of uh, fish eggs, haddock eggs in 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 the sea, and uh, and it was just being fitted with a with a, with a, with a generalized additive model, and the model was quite well fit, so that in in so if there isn't actually much going on, so that if you've got data is smooth and rough and there's no spatial patterning in the rough, then maybe that, that's, that's sort of good enough so that we can just stay with, uh, with aspatial models because th there isn't anything more to be picked up. In the mixed model version, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, it's possible to use a, a spatial smooth as a, I was using the example of uh, Markov uh, random fields in Bayes-X and, and uh, MGCV and, and so on. 
but it's also possible to use a geostatistical approach uh, by modeling the smooth as, as a function of a, a variogram. If you called it a correlogram, then it, the, the correlogram would go that the correlation between the values at a short distance is very high and falls off with increasing increasing distance. A variogram goes from the, the, the a function of the distance, so the, sorry, a function of the difference between the observed values uh, is very small. The difference between observations expected to be very small at short distances and that it increases uh, with increasing increasing distance. So this is this is the expression of, of the model. This is the the smooth. This is the the, uh, the 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 spatial smooth. These are the these are the un unobservable microscale variation. So that if we had had observations which were closer to each other, we could pick up more of the spatial variation at a local scale. But the observations, I mean, you can't dig up everything <laughs> to collect data. Uh, because at that stage you've got no you've got no reality left, uh, so you have to sample. But some of the spatial variability m may be local, and uh, this would then be the the white noise measurement error or the white white noise error uh, at the end of the process. Uh, so we need to fit this the 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 covariance covariance function. The two steps is one is modeling the smooth scale variability. And the other is to is to make a prediction from the mean function and the fitted models that we've got a, the, an, a fit of the smooth and a fit of the spatial smooth, and we use that for for, for making the, 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 the prediction. It's also possible to fit an empirical uh, variogram by hand, and uh, until the 1970s, probably uh, many. Um, um, practical application, certainly in mining, would be done by hand fitting of the variogram. So you'd have data, which would be the differences in variables, in differences uh, between in the variable of interest at different uh, distance bins, and then you would uh, an analyst would would say, okay, I've seen results like this from another field study, so that it's going to look about like this. This is this is the shape of the curve. Uh, and then express the curve, say, as uh, as an exponential function or as uh, as, a, as a known functional form, and then fit the, the place the coefficients on on on, on that, um, and sort of 30, 40, 50 years ago, then this would be usually the way that that work would be would be carried out, uh, simply because they they they, they knew the the. Um, the chemistry, the physics, the biology of the underlying processes, and could say, well, actually, it, it would be really unlikely that that, that you'd have, see any interaction over the, this number of this range, uh, this the, this the, this number of meters. It, it's just not going to happen. There's no way that it can happen in a system where some other characteristic is not interfering with with the distribution of the, of the data. Uh, the the term Krieging comes from from uh, South African gold mining, uh, and mineral extraction was also a good deal of the of the backstory in in the the, the very early period, which was then formalised uh, in different views of the subject uh, along uh, a number of possible routes. One route uh, described by Cressy was that uh, a French uh, a geostatistician. Uh, this is the Ecole de Mine in 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 Paris. Um, conceptualized uh, the underlying relationships and the uh, linear algebra needed to get to the to to demonstrate that the predictions were the 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 best linear unbiased uh, predictions. So, uh, Georges Matheron. Uh, Konstantin Krivoruchko points to the fact that there was an existing literature among Soviet mathematicians, but particularly that they weren't as interested in the mining domain, as of geology mining, they were interested in the meteorological domain. And uh, uh, a student of uh, Kolmogorov, so that you're looking at the Markov processes, stochastic processes in which uh, Soviet mathematics was very strong, 
stochastic process is leading to Kolmogorov, and then Gandin was a student of Kolmogorov, and Gandin was interested in hydrological and meteorological applications of stochastic processes in, in uh, more than one dimension. Now, whether there was a leakage between the Soviet school and Matheron or not is, is unknown. Uh, Konstantin Kreboruchko maintains that there was leakage, that is, that Matheron uh, made his sort of uh, discoveries having become acquainted with work which was already ongoing. Uh, and it's very difficult at this stage to, to reconstruct uh, ac actually what was going on. But there's certainly uh, an intellectual debt to the work of, of statisticians such as, as Kolmogorov. So that the, when we talk about statistics uh, in general, and we talk about the... the, 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 the uh, uh, in in, in the, the British tradition, then you talk about the... Uh, the uh, uh, agricultural field stations and fisher and so on and so forth. But actually st statistics was being studied in different uh, domains across the world and certainly one of, one of the strong ones from, from the, the, uh, from, from, from the pre-war period and then through into the post-war period was, was mathematics in, in the Soviet Union. Um, we don't know, but there, there were a number of things which we, which which played in, in into each other. Geostatistics has a has a a specific tradition in exploratory spatial data analysis, and this was part of the of the field scientists getting your hands dirty. Uh, element involved in handling data which was, say, not observed by radio sounds, so that if you're dealing with meteorological data or hydrological data, you're not as uh, uh, concerned. You, you, you have perhaps more control of some of the background variables. Maybe the background variables aren't so important. But if you're dealing with mineral samples or soil samples, then you're, you're probably more involved in having to look at what's actually going on. So do, is our understanding of the underlying data generating process uh, adequate? Now, in uh, 19, 1997, there was a... Uh, a um, uh, spatial interpolation comparison. Um, this is discussed in, in the Diggle and Ribeiro 2007 book. Uh, so this is the model-based geostatistics. And uh, the GOR package, there's GOR and GOR GLM. So there are two packages, one for, for continuous uh, uh, variables of interest and one for discrete variables of interest in a GLM uh, setting. So there are two packages associated with the, 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 the foundation of uh, model-based geostatistics. Uh, both GOR and GSTAT include the data which was used for the, for the, compar the 1997 comparison. Um, these were 467 meteorological stations across Switzerland measuring precipitation on the 8th of May 1986, measured in uh, tenths of millimeters. Uh, and the idea for the comparison so that different people's software should be used to, to try and sort of find out what's going on here uh, was to take 100 training sites and then to predict for the remaining uh, 367 meteorological stations so that, that you were getting... A, you knew what the precipitation was at the, at the uh, 367 uh, test sites and then, then you could rank the, the, the different uh, uh, implementations of Krieging prediction uh, on, that, on that basis. There are quite a number of different Krieging prediction uh, settings. Um, I, I really do not know whether any of you would have encountered... Um, would have encountered... And now I'm not sure whether this will find it. No, it says that it doesn't. Yes, Riostat was not what I was looking for. Uh, and then it's still going for Riostat. Um, 
maybe if I say Paris. No, 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 no. This isn't getting there. Perhaps, perhaps I should, perhaps I should back off and try Google. Um, Uh, I do not mean, uh, 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 okay, this is it, and it's uh, it's free. So okay, so that our geostats, I should have put an S on the on the end. Sorry, Ecole de Mine had had um, uh, written an R package called RGOS, but we claimed precedence because we had the RGOS package published with that name previously, and they, they haven't been able to shift from, uh, so they're using, the, they have an, uh, an underlying library, they use their package to interface their library, and they are uh, involved in consulting, so that, for instance, the, the Marine Research Institute here for quite a long time was buying uh, 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 geostatistical prediction software from uh, Ecole de Mine, um, and um, so that they have their there, um, so that this is this is available for downloading. It's not on CRAN, uh, and they require that you cite them, and and all kinds of things like that. Um, they have the. Uh, they also have a number of other um, sort of approaches uh, around that. It, they backed off this so that they said they weren't going to. But but they, they they don't play with the the R community. They don't go to conferences and, and they, they uh, which is sorry. Have you have you seen that? Have you used has anybody used R geostats? It would probably be quite useful if someone is 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 in or knows people who do um, who do um, geostatistical prediction. It might be quite interesting to see how it performs uh, related to, to, to others. But the, the, uh, that group, a group at Stanford and other people had their own libraries, compiled libraries uh, for, for doing, uh, for doing uh, geostatistical prediction. There are a number of other traditions which are, uh, which are based on, on uh, um, other machine learning uh, approaches, which have been around for for, for 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 some time, but the in 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 this competition, there the, the, there were a number of uh, a number of possible results. Now, what one sees with regard, so uh, this is this is the straight uh, GOR approach. So that we're using the GOR approach. So if we say, okay, we load the data from the uh, from the spatial interpolation comparison. Uh, competition, uh, and then we get the values here. Split it by quartiles, so that the 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 the, um, uh, the quartiles are, are matched from uh, f the the values are actually higher here and lower here. Then we look at the is there a trend in the in the latitude dimension? Is there a trend in the longitude dimension? Unfortunately, in GOR, the locations of the uh, of the stations are given in some uh, unknown uh, projection. So we don't know what the projection of the data is. It's said to be planar, and it's said to have been generalized from a Swiss national uh, uh, projection, standard projection. But trying to find out what it is has not been successful so far. And then looking at the data itself, is the data sort of normally distributed or is it not normally distributed? These are the precipitation figures in the tenths of a millimeter. So this, this is then 60 millimeters. This is, this is 10 millimeters. So it was a day with a good deal of precipitation. Uh, what one would also need to do is, is to do some, some variogram uh, diagnostics. And one of the ways to do this is to uh, with with regard to this, uh, this is the distribution of the data, and if we assume that the mean model, the smooth, is the intercept, then uh, this would be the shape of the distribution that we're looking at. However, if we include uh, something more in the smooth, and in this case they include the altitude 
of the meteorological stations as a, cover, a relevant covariate, uh, then the shape of the residual will not necessarily be the shape of the data. So that you then need to fit a model with the uh, with the uh, covariate and uh, you, you'd need to re-examine the, the the values with respect to the to, to the residuals having taken the mean model into account. Uh, so that uh, uh, GOR doesn't do that. It, it takes the usual geostatistical approaches that the the mean model is just going to be the the mean of the of the observed data. Whereas in fact, using a richer mean model, uh, Tom Hengel has called it regression, or as uh, he uses the term coined by somebody before him uh, as regression krieging. So regression krieging would be that you you fit a model which is um, justified by the science with relevant covariates and observed at the, at the same locations. And then uh, you, you're doing your geostatistical prediction using the values of those covariates and uh, the, the spatial smooth fitted on the residual, but not on the, on the, um, on the data. So the data are filtered through a, uh, the mean model first. So variogram diagnostics, that what we're doing here is reconstructing the data as it was uh, um, provided by a GOR. GOR is not an SP compliant uh, package and, and was published before SP was available. GSTAT is SP and SF and STARS compliant. Uh, so what you're interested in doing is looking whether the, the, these are then pairs of distances, so that this is uh, uh, between zero and 20 kilometers, between 20 and 40 kilometers, 40 and 60 kilometers, 60 and 80 kilometers. And are we seeing the same kinds of, what kinds of patterns are we seeing at these distances? Now, one of the things you see immediately from the plot is that actually the, the placing of the stations is, mm, it's by kilometer, so the, 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 re, the, the resolution of where the stations actually are uh, is not very, uh, not very accurately defined. But for, for our purposes, maybe this doesn't, for, 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 this, for this comparison, it didn't matter because everybody was facing the same data. But the reason for the odd blockiness is that the distances are mostly in, in whole uh, kilometers. Sorry, uh, this is this is precipit this is the precipitation values. These are the differences in precipitation values, uh, and the the relationship appears to be uh, appears to be um, declining in distance. You can see this is this is uh, just a correlation coefficient. This is a correlation coefficient for the next bin. This is a correlation coefficient for the next bin. Then it goes up a bit. And then, so, so that this one maybe is is a little unusual that there's something odd going on between forty and sixty kilometers. So these are just correlation coefficients for all of the pairs within within that bin. We could uh, compute a variogram cloud, uh, and so these these the this is this is a variogram cloud, and then there are two um, two attempts to draw a line uh, along. Uh, along the the bins, so the, this is the variogram cloud. The vertical lines are showing the bins into which the uh, the the uh, semi variance. That's a function of the difference uh, between observations or between values of the variable of interest. So the semi variance is here, and then we 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 get um, two 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 lines drawn. They're simply lines drawn between the, uh, the center points of those bins. And the center points of the bins, which is what, what would, is later going to be used for fitting a variogram, the center points of the bins are um, uh, in the, as he, here, here there's a distinction between classical and robust, and this, this was then taken here. If Cressy is true, then the center point of the distribution of the semivariances within the bin is estimated as the median. 
so that 50% of the pairs will be above, 50% of the pairs will be below. Uh, the classical, so that's robust. The classical is it's the mean, so that if you have just one or two pairs which are very large, then it will pull the mean up. And, but the, these, are, these aren't fitted variograms. These are the empirical variograms with two different versions of how things... And we can see that there's, there's something going on uh, in a bin around 40, 50 kilometres. Yeah, so there's a jump there. Uh, we could uh, express... Uh, once we've, we've got the same bins here again. Uh, and here we're showing the distributions of the semivariances by bin. So you can see here that the, the, the dotted line is when it's taking the mean, and the bars across the middle of the uh, box plots are the medians. So 50% of the pairs are below, 50% of the pairs are above. So the, the Cressy argued uh, in, in the 91 book and, and in papers before that, that using the median to, to say which point we should put on this graph and then how we, if, if you're, you're, fitting the, you're fitting the variogram to this, should you fit it to the, the points represented by the means within the bins or should you use the medians within the bins? Being robust maybe is okay, but it, maybe it means that you, you get a, a noisier, maybe less noisy, but there's a choice that needs to be made uh, at this point. Um, another thing that might happen is that so far we've only looked at distances in one, in, in uh, uh, what, what's known as a, an isotropic setting, which means that the distances between points do not take into account at all which direction. So that we're looking at things in the round, so that if the distance is going westwards, going eastwards, going northwards, or going southwards. It doesn't make any difference at all. Uh, but it's possible to look at uh, an anisotropic setting to see whether the variogram clouds or the sets of, uh, of, of um, dots that you would get either on the medians or on the means in the bins vary between directions. They're, they're still always symmetric. That is, if you're going uh, um, northwestwards, then southeast is the other side, which is symmetric. So the distances are symmetric al along this um, section of the data. So you, you're looking at pairs in a particular, and then there's, there's a way of plotting. Uh, plotting the uh, a, a very an empirical variogram map uh, to see whether there's something going on and maybe there is. If there's something going on, it's possible to fit two variograms, one for the major axis, one for the minor axis, or to say that okay, maybe there's a a, a trend which should have been included in the mean models. You can attempt to address that in that way. There's a further corollary to that, which is that some data are directional. Uh, in particular, if you're looking at samples on a stream network, then it is improbable that downstream pollution can affect upstream pollution. But in the standard geostatistical model, they do. Uh, which isn't so that there are there are other models for uh, asymmetric settings. Uh, which are not in the standard in the standard software. So that here we've got uh, uh, an, uh, the the four um, variograms. Here the variograms are taken uh, are taken. The, these are the variograms for the AE. Uh, so this is the the object which is. So this is uh, uh, generating four empirical variograms. Uh, based on uh, the um, so that the the axes is is uh, is uh, zero hundred and eighty forty five uh, uh, to two hundred and thirty five 
225, then 90, uh, 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 270, 135, and then 40, so it will be 45, uh, 315. So it's, it's putting four, four lines across, and these are then the, uh, the, 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 the empirical variograms for those four directions. Is there a big difference? Maybe this one is much lower. There's, there's some action going on here in two of the directions, but not all of the directions. That's at this around 40, around 40 kilometers. There's something, something going on. So that there there are some 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 oddities oddities uh, oddities uh, there. Variogram fitting in GOR can be done by um, uh, uh, weighted least squares. The weighting of the least squares is because uh, in in uh, in this case and in these cases, this here you could see this this most directly, but I didn't draw your attention to it before. The widths of the box plots are proportional to the number of pairs in the bin. So that here we've got quite a lot of pairs in the bins, the bins are quite broad, but as you get to the shorter, dis shorter interpair distances, there are very few. So that what, what if, if you just fit using least squares or nonlinear least squares, because it's a curve you're trying to fit, then the, the, the dot you've got at the bottom, which is saying this, at this distance, the, uh, the mean semivariance is, but that mean is calculated from very few pairs. And a little further away, you will have many, many more pairs uh, supporting the mean of the semivariance. So uh, GOR uses, uses um, uh, weighted least squares, and it, uh, it can also fit them by by um, uh, maximum likelihood. So that lick fit is a maximum likelihood fit, and the other fit is by weighted least squares. And these are then then a fit of of the model. The uh, underlying model uh, that would be chosen in GOR is what's known as the Matern model. Matern was a, a Swedish uh, um, uh, forestry scientist. Uh, and it includes three three parameters. One one is is uh, related to the 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 range. So, when does the line go flat? Uh, there's a variance component. Uh, in addition to that, there may be a separate model, which would be re related to what would be known as the nugget effect. And the nugget effect is how much unobservable variance should we guess is in the model? And the nugget effect obviously comes from, from mining because you could have a sample which hits a nugget of gold and you could have a sample 10 centimeters away which doesn't hit the nugget. So that there would be a lot of noise at very short distances. And if that is the case, then you may fit a, a nugget effect which is saying we know something about the, the local variability that we, we wouldn't expect at, at zero, or at very close to zero distance, for the semivariance to fall to zero. Here we've said, if the dist as the distance gets smaller and smaller and smaller, we'd expect the difference between the observed values to approach zero, for obvious reasons. But if we know from the from the geology or uh, biology or chemistry of the setting that there will be local variability some of it may be observed some of it may be uh, may not be observed so that you can say okay we expect semivariance to to reach the zero distance but with with uh, measurable differences a variogram fitting in gstat fit variogram again it's a, a weighted uh, weighted least squares approach so here are the points from the 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 centers of the bins and fitting the 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 um, the uh, the variogram the variogram that we're fitting here is the uh, is 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 this this one defined here but here we're, we're choosing the model that that in in GOR you can choose the middle but the default is is matern here we're fitting a matern with with a partial sill a range 
Uh, we're also saying that we want to in, uh, see if there is a nugget, and the kappa, which is the extra coefficient for the uh, for the um, uh, for the matern. Uh, the fitted values for these uh, end up being uh, a partial sill of of um, uh, this is measured in the in the, the scaling of the semivariance. So the partial sill is at uh, almost 17,000, so it's about there. The range is about 50 kilometers. So that's here. Uh, and uh, we, we tried to fit a nugget and it's come back saying the nugget is, is zero. So it says we, we don't find evidence in the in, in the empirical variogram for, for, a nugget, uh, for a nugget to be present. So this is then the fitted variogram. In the GOR setting and in the GSTAT setting, we know something about the, about the goodness of fit of these. In uh, conventional geostatistics, we then say, okay, we take the variograms as fixed, and we just use them for, for, for prediction. And here we'd be doing a, uni uh, a universal creaking or regression creaking uh, fit. Uh, in the GSTAT approach, uh, in, in GOR, we have, if you see here, We've said that the trend is the formula, it's the altitude. So it's a one-sided formula saying altitude is playing into this. In GSTAT, where we defined G earlier as G is defined here. Uh, we're call, calling the thing precipitation, but the formula is that it's precipitation is the data and uh, the smooth is altitude. The, the, so that they're both set up in 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 the same in the same way. So it's variogram fitting, variogram fitting, and then Krieging prediction from 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 the variogram model. Uh, so that in in the case of so we say here that that the 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 uh, uh, universal Krieging regression Krieging fit. Uh, here we've got the 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 object that we're looking at, which contains the data. This is its name, and this is the fitted empirical variogram model that we're going to use to create the fit. We then make predictions from the fit, saying that the 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 data that we were using was the was the uh, was the uh, training set, and we're now fitting the uh, fitting the fitting the data, and turning off the debugging level, and then we're going to uh, we're going to. Um, um, Uh, the variance at the known sites is uh, is uh, zero, so by definition. So so here, what we're doing is subsetting it to get the the prediction output for is taking the 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 the, the sorry um, in the in the definition of the data set we don't know which of the, the whole data are the training set and the test set. So here we're separating out the test set. So the test set is this one. Here we're doing the fittings. So Z is the, is the, is, are the, are the, are the predictions for the, for the test set. Uh, using conventional Krieging in a GOR, uh, what we're saying here is that we've got the, the, um, uh, the test data set We've got the locations. Uh, we've got the trend in the data, and the trend in the prediction locations, and we're saying that we're using the uh, the uh, the fitted variogram that we generated earlier. Uh, it's also possible to carry out Krieging both in uh, GSTAT and GOR using a local. Uh, a local neighborhood rather than a global neighborhood. So if you're using a global neighborhood, some of the linear algebra becomes more complicated because it, it, you're using uh, all of the observed uh, locations to predict each of the points, whereas using uh, the, in the neighborhood of the prediction location, you could find some 
uh, some uh, meteorological stations which were observed. So you don't need to use the whole set of of uh, meteorological stations to make every prediction. You use just the ones which are close to the prediction point. So we've then got uh, uh, some uh, um, uh, some uh, results that we've got. Uh, one here using the uh, the um, weighted least squares variogram fit. One here using maximum likelihood fit, and they're taking them. That this is conventional Krieging, so it's 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 not passing through the variability in fitting the variogram, and we can also use Bayesian Krieging here to uh, to fit the variogram internally using sampling and pass through the distribution so that it's 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 doing it all at once it's not fitting the variogram separately and passing it through as fixed values it's taking the pairs of values fitting the variogram internally and and uh, it it's a bit noisy uh, so that it 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 does say a number of uh, things as it's as it's going through it says sampling from posterior distribution sampling from the joint posterior distribution and uh, these are the values as it's going through, and I think I specified, I didn't specify, uh, but it took the default number of parameter sets. Um, it's possible to uh, also to set starting values for, for the distributions. Um, it's then also possible to, it's then also possible for uh, any of the prediction locations, but say we take one of the prediction locations and we want the uh, theoretical conventional geost geostatistical distribution around that uh, around that prediction value, the prediction standard error from the conventional Krieging approach, and we can also sample draws from a prediction location to see with the whole uh, posterior distribution of the model, what we would get. And actually, this is choosing prediction location one. As what we've done here is, is plotting the density of the predictives for the simulations for the Bayesian Krieging. But we can also take out the, 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 the fitted location is, is red from Bayesian Krieging, which is in the middle of distribution. The blue one is from the uh, from the uh, conventional Krieging. This is the the normal curve around. So, the, so we, sorry, we've got the 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 um, the the dotted line is a curve taking the, uh, as this is a smooth curve, from the Bayesian Krieging taking the mean and standard deviation of the distribution. And we can also plot the density of the whole dis di distribution. We can see that the, the, the theoretical, the, or the Bayesian result is somewhat different for, in this case for the, uh, but here I haven't plotted, and I, th I thought I'd plotted the, uh, the uh, distribution given by the, by the, um, so all I've done is put the blue line for the uh, for the um, conventional Krieging prediction for that location. I should have added an, uh, another set of lines from the prediction standard error for that. Uh, in, I, I thought I had thought it was there, but it isn't. It isn't there. So maybe I deleted it. Uh, the automat package arrived based on on GSTAT uh, arrived uh, about ten years ago is associated with a series of research projects on displaying uncertainty in Krieging prediction. Uh, and uh, by default goes for the stain uh, parameterization of the matter and model, but it can choose it can choose others. So that first it looks at which model representation best matches the variogram the empirical variogram, and then go, goes on from, from, from there. So that it's using Krieging prediction. Uh, it presents the empirical variogram so that the model is, is not mat, it's stay, but 
stay is is a is a reparameterization of the Matan Matan model. Um, the the sill and the range are expressed in different quantities from the ones that we were seeing uh, we were seeing previously. Uh, what is interesting is that it displays the count of uh, pairs at each of the bins which it's chosen, and it's chosen fewer bins so that. If you change the number of bins, then very likely the variogram will also change. And um, uh, we can also, as I'll give you a sketch of um, uh, machine learning. I'm sorry, every time I see ML, then I see maximum likelihood. I don't see machine learning. Sorry, but this is machine learning. Uh, and this is uh, work by Tom Hengel and, and and uh, collaborators, uh, where what you do is you you simply uh, calculate the distances from the uh, each of the observations, the distances which will be used for the pair. So that for, for each observation, you say, what's my distance to all of the other observations? So you've got all of those. And then you use the distances from the observations to the prediction locations in prediction. So that you fit the model on the data using the distances, in this case, 100 distances, so you've got a square matrix of distances, which you add on to the precipitation and, and uh, altitude. So that the, the, uh, uh, what you're then getting is a formula which is precipitation depends on altitude plus 100 uh, distances. And you fit in this. In this case, it's being fitted uh, using uh, uh, random forest in the ranger package, uh, and uh, so you've got uh, random forest is then going on, and you're making predictions from this. However, uh, it in the cases that Tom Hengel gives in his references for this technique. It works really quite well, but it doesn't work well for reasons which are unexplored with the Swiss uh, uh, precipitation data. So that compared to the outcome of the competition 20 years ago, then, then uh, using uh, random forest to try and find out which distances are important for which of the stations doesn't really doesn't give a, an enormously uh, enormously uh, convincing output. So that the these would be the precipitation estimates, and these would be the variable prediction estimates. Um, the um, and the the the, dis the display is not is not brilliant either. So there's 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 a, there's, a, there's a certain amount of other stuff going on there. Other work, say by uh, by Hanna Meyer, on using machine learning approaches to uh, to geostatistical prediction, are much more successful. And that in this room, she got the uh, prize at the Open GeoHub seminar five years ago. For, there's, a, there's always a competition at the Open GeoHub seminars where uh, you can try and make an optimal prediction for a given data set. Um, so, uh, so these the these were the uh, um, uh, these are the predictions for. Um, the, the predictions for for the 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 the, the, the conventional Kriging approaches. Um, these are random forest, and the, the, these are a much better fit. That's the, the, the. So maybe there's an opening there. Quite a lot of work is still done using uh, conventional Krieging. It's possible to move to model-based geostatistics, and there are many packages which now offer tho those facilities. Model-based geostatistics is statistically more be better uh, founded, uh, simply because you're not throwing away the variability involved in estimating the variogram, and probably uh, Bayesian statistics by giving you uh, a, a joint posterior distribution in many of the hyperparameters involved in deciding how to do it uh, can, can, can be quite successful. Uh, however, uh, approaches such as empirical Bayesian 
creaking, which I mentioned with regard to support, uh, are uh, arguably um, strong competitors with conventional creaking, but uh, accepting that they're uh, giving much more weight to the uh, input data variability rather than the input data mean. Uh, so I'll go on and spend uh, the next 40 minutes talking about point patterns relatively, uh, relatively uh, briefly. Uh, in both of these cases, many of the references are in, in our books, so that they're, they're, they're fairly easy to find. Uh, point patterns, if we see a pattern on the map of points, we may see one pattern, we may see a mixture of patterns, and it may be difficult to uh, reconstruct the uh, point pattern process from the observed pattern. And there is uh, uh, mileage in this from... Uh, way back from from the from the late 60s on studies of by Gunnar Olsen uh, studies of, of set, settlement diffusion in northern Sweden in the 16th 17th and 18th century so that he found that mm, several different point process models several different point process models uh, fit fit the data equally well. So that if you said, okay, well, we think it's this point process model, and you simulate from that, then you can get a good fit to the observed locations. Choose a different model, simulate from it, and it gives you an equally good, and, and the two models are based on different theoretical uh, assumptions. So how, how do you know, and, and the, his, his uh, tentative conclusion in 1968 was, well, you don't. Um, in a, At about the same time, there was a good deal of discussion of, of equifinality. That is, you have an observed pattern, and you can make hypotheses about different processes which could lead to that pattern, but you don't have a way of, because you can't experiment with them, you don't have a way of judging whether it's this one or that one. You just say, both of these give us the same uh, observable pattern. Uh, it's possible to analyze point patterns in, in a number of, uh, of, 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 of different ways. Uh, point patterns are included in uh, both in Brian Ripley's uh, 1981 book, in Cressy's 1991-93 book. Uh, Brian Ripley probably has more sympathy for point patterns than Cressy. Cressy was much more in geostatistics. And uh, in the contemporary setting, then uh, probably the, the, the work done around SPATSTAT is, is where quite a lot of the action is. There are, there are also differences been between disciplines in the way that these things, these things are, are handled. Uh, one, one short case is the handling of a landform called drumlins. These are pictures uh, from Poland. There are, there are other pictures from, from, um, uh, from further down. Uh, a drumlin is a, a small hill built of boulder clay, so that it's one of the landscape features which is left after a, a continental ice sheet has advanced. And just sort of melt in place so that quite a lot of the of the very small particulate matter the clay which is left in it which is in the ice then just gets dumped but the drumlins form what what is termed a basket of eggs landscape so that there are small hills not uh, in rows or anything like that but just just scattered around the landscape they're not very high. Perhaps the, the altitude from the dips between the hills to the summits is maybe 20 to 30 meters. Uh, for agriculture, there's something of a problem because the, there's no good drainage pattern in the, uh, in the... They're not valleys because it's not a stream network uh, in between the, 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 the little hills, in between the drumlins. So that you tend to get uh, wet, cold clay in the dips possibly with marshes, sometimes with, as you can see here, that there are, there are some, some willow trees, so it's wet there. Um, and sometimes the, 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 there is sufficient drainage, but there's no, there's no obvious drainage pattern appearing in, in this, so that streams will, 
uh, go around and so th then they're not creating a valley between these uh, 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 so through this this landscape apart from much larger rivers which which can can cut through so the data uh, are um, um, uh, taken from the original sources uh, so the data were originally given by by Smalley and Unwin uh, and Hill so these, this is uh, a, a well-known data set in, in quantitative geography this is a scan from the book and the the, the actual discussion in uh, in uh, in terms of the, 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 this was the full set of drumlins which was observed and the drumlins which are included in the in the standard data sets are are from this this one here so that there's a data set referred to in in O'Sullivan and Unwin 2003 uh, um, and 2010 uh, which is this one and there's a similar one uh, in in the spatial package and again then they're, they're not properly registered so we don't know exactly where where, 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 they, where they were so this is this is the the uh, data set it's slightly angular and um, in uh, the standard setting the data would be read in using um, uh, in the SF package ST uh, re underscore read or read OGR in this case from from a shape file uh, and here we're just converting them to spatial points because all we need are the points we don't need any other identifying variables uh, to use them with uh, SPATSTAT, we uh, use a coercion uh, uh, method, which is available in the Map Tools package, to coerce from spatial points or an SFC of points to uh, a PPP object in the in the SPATSTAT package. So we just say as and this was the spatial points object and turn it into a PPP. And then we can we can uh, look at what it says about itself. That it's a, in this case it's it's a, it's six points. But we could have printed the whole one. It would have been it would have been um, uh, it would have been two hundred and thirty two uh, drumlins. So we've got two hundred and thirty two uh, drumlins there. But it's 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 a a point pattern. Um, this is the the bounding geometry. And again, we're not sure what the what 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 the the units are. They may be in kilometers, but we're we're, we're not sure. Now, if you look at this, you'll see that uh, we have the bounding box of the uh, of the of of the data. Now, is the bounding box a reasonable way of defining the boundaries around the data? Now, one of the ways to define the area of interest for a point pattern is to say, okay, it's the bounding box, but that then means that some of the points lie on the boundary of the area, and we have absolutely no idea whatsoever whether there were unobserved points immediately beyond the boundary. We could, however, choose to use the convex hull of the points, which means that we won't get empty areas in the corners, However, the convex hull also goes through the points which are on the areas, or on the edge of the area. So that saying which area of interest we wish to use is, is crucial. And uh, Brian Ripley defines a... Uh, least problematic. So what you're doing is you're taking the convex hull of the points and buffering it out a little. So you buffer out the convex hull by some measure of the average interpoint distances. So that probably if you buffer out like that, you're creating an area which is a bit bigger than the convex hull. Typically it'll be a bit smaller than the bounding box because it misses the empty areas at the corners. But you need to think about it because uh, point, pattern, uh, point pattern analysis or point, pat point process analysis is crucially dependent on defining the area of interest because you're saying that we're looking at the intensity of the points across the surface but then you have to define the surface area to see uh, what it is that you're looking at 
uh, a traditional way of handling uh, uh, points was to uh, conduct quadrat analysis, which is to divide uh, the study area up into blocks. These are the ones which are, which, which, are, which are here, the regular ones in the middle. So you divide it up into blocks. Here we've divided up into 20 blocks. And then you just count the, count the number of points in each of the blocks. As the blocks are of the same area, so that would give us something we could, uh, say, run a, a, a chi-square test on to see whether the number of points is spread equally across the, the grid uh, of quadrats. So there's a quadrat test, and this would suggest that probably the counts of points here are not spatially, uh, completely spatially randomly distributed. If they were distributed across, in this case, the bounding box by, uh, by um, okay. Drumlin's RR is the object which uh, uses the window of the Ripley, uh, uh, the Ripley boundaries. But we've done the quadrat analysis uh, on just on Drumlin's PPP and not on the Drumlin's uh, PPP uh, Drumlin's RR. However, this is using a default number of grids, and we can get a different result if we change the the uh, number of bins in each direction. So that here we're using a grid of five by five grid of tiles. Here we're using a six by six grid of tiles, and getting a different result. If we use the Ripley one, it's irregular windows, 25 tiles in irregular windows. Quadrat analysis is, is not generally supported. No, but it, it's, it's in the uh, even older textbooks than Ripley and Cressy, and so it's discussed there because it was something you could do by hand. A much more uh, satisfying approach is to use density plots and so the density plots here, we've varied the, the uh, bandwidth of the two-dimensional kernels uh, uh, 0.75 from 1, 0 0.75, 0 0.5, 0 0.25. Uh, and depending on the kernel bandwidth, then we get, uh, if we're looking at the, 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 the smoothest picture, then we get uh, uh, intensities per unit area uh, which are, we can see that there's a band through here. This is the, the area with the highest densities. There's a band of elevated density here, and then there are two areas of low density. If we tighten the bandwidth, so the kernel which is moving around uh, the, a grid uh, here, uh, gives us a more detailed picture of the high intensity points. Here, we're again tightening the bandwidth of the kernel, so it's picking out more of the variability, and we can see that there are a number of maybe clusters of uh, locations where there, where there are relatively many points, and there are other places where there are relatively few points. And if we change the bandwidth again, uh, sort of tighten the bandwidth again, then we're getting quite a lot of, uh, of uh, signaling that there are things going on. This one appears to be uh, a number of points which are really close together. There appear to be, through this, through this central area, there appear to be uh, other sim similar, similar cases. So narrower bandwidths yield m more extreme values and broader bandwidths n narrow the interquartile range. Uh, so if we tabulate the, um, the, uh, the values so that, that for the, uh, for the uh, aerial intensity. We could look at here the um, this one with the narrowest bandwidth. We can see that the minimum value is, is close to zero. The maximum value is more than 11. If we go to the smoothest one, then we're going from one to five. In this case, we're going from a half to five. We're going from uh, not, not 0.2 to six. And then when we change the bandwidth again, so that we're we're we're, we're changing the uh, the distribution of the of the values. Uh, the nearest neighbor distances 
are another approach. Uh, if you think uh, back to the 1950s and 19, early 1960s, then measuring nearest neighbor distances was something that it was possible to do uh, uh, analog. So the analog treatment would be to take a, uh, uh, either a compass or some other way, way of measuring distances. You'd put, uh, you'd put the point in each point, you'd put the point of the instrument on top of the point of interest and you would draw around it until you, so you'd identify which point is the closest and then you'd read off the distance for that point, so that for point I, the distance the nearest neighbours is in map scale maybe maybe uh, 1.7 centimetres, and then you would note down what the nearest nearest neighbour distances were. So you could you could ask nearest neighbour distances here. Uh, obviously, they are not going to go beyond the the convex hull because the, because they can't because there aren't any neighbors outside the con convex hull. And we can, we can plot an empirical cumulative uh, distribution function of the nearest neighbor distances. The most isolated drumlin is, is uh, a whole unit distance, probably kilometer from, from the nearest other uh, drumlin observed in this, in this subset of the data set. Uh, the uh, em empirical cumulative distribution function is also, one of the measures which then uh, enters into this, which is the, the what's known as the G hat. So the G hat measure is just the empirical cumulative distribution function of uh, nearest neighbor distances plotted by default with the expected um, uh, expect, expected completely spatially random line. Now, when you get to Uh, the theoretical treatment or the expected treatment, then you're dealing with an expression of what we would expect the distribution to be within the area of interest, that defining the window within which one is generating the... Um, the so we have the, the, the data and we have a hypothesis that the data have been generated by a, a, a Poisson process that's a completely spatially random process. So that the intensity should be uniform over the, over the whole area. Um, it's also possible to simulate from this so that the red line is giving us the theoretical so that if it was completely spatially random, that would be what would be going on. This is the observed empirical cumulative distribution function. The scales are a little bit different. So these are the, the scales here and there. And one can also run simulations, so that in this case we're running 99 simulations and uh, constructing an envelope, uh, which is then giving us uh, a uh, plus or minus two standard deviations. So that it's sort of... Uh, 5% of the simulations were higher than this, and 95% uh, were higher than, than this. So we get a, an envelope that this gray uh, construction is, 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 is the envelope and is, is what we would expect if we simulate from uh, a completely spatially random distribution. Now, the links between sampling from a... a, a prior distribution, it's the prior distribution, what we think it is. And then we're looking at the data and saying, do they, di do they di diverge? This is very much like parametric bootstrap. It also feeds into Monte Carlo testing. So it's the same, same kind of background. Because the, uh, it, was, it, it, it is uh, uh, challenging to distinguish between, the, it is possible to construct a formal test between this line and this line. Do these lines differ? There's a Clark Evan, uh, Evans R statistic based on nearest neighbor distances. But remember, we're using one distance for each point. So we could, we could, do, we could, do, uh, we could do this, but we also get uh, different outcomes depending on what we're doing with correction for edge effects. Do we think that 
uh, that uh, caught the uh, um, completely spatially random was a good idea. We can say that actually this pattern doesn't appear to be a, have been generated as completely spatially random. It doesn't look like that, but does that tell us that the drumlins are clustered, which would be the, if you like, the conventional conclusion? Um, or are they regularly distributed, which might also be a, a conclusion? So what's happening here, we're seeing that there are, there are no nearest neighbors, which are less than about one and a half of the, or sort of not point, almost not, not point 0.15 of these units. So if we say that they're, they're in kilometers, that would be 150, 160 meters. There are no drumlins which are closer than that. So is it sensible to test against something which is not going to happen? Because they, if they were completely spatially random, then some of them would be closer than 150 meters, and none of them are, which means that something is going on here. And an alternative, an alternative hypothesis might be to use a simple sequential inhibition model, which says that the points are completely spatially randomly distributed, but they don't occur closer than, in this case, uh, 180 meters. That, they, the, 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 that they're inhibited. And the inhibition in this case is that the, 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 the sort of dump of clay, which the drumlin is, is a sort of dump of clay that has been dumped. For one drumlin to form, it can't sit on another drumlin. So you can't have one drumlin on top of another drumlin. In completely spatially random, the points are not constrained by how close they can be. But say, say we try simple sequential inhibition by saying that we're completely spatially random, but if a completely spatially random point falls within 100 meters, 180 meters of another, we delete it and go on some sample another. So we carry on sampling to get to the correct number, but we don't allow them to be closer than 180 meters from one from another. And rerun the envelope, but this time using the, uh, this simulation expression. So that the simulation expression we were using, we were using here, was that it's, 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 it's a uni uniform point, so the, it's completely spatially random. And now we're saying it's completely spatially random, but uh, the drumlins can't be closer one to another than uh, 180 meters. And what we're then interested in doing is seeing whether we get a good fit to the data. And now we're actually the, the empirical nearest neighbor distance, the empirical G hat line, is very, very close to the envelope. So it, 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 maybe 180 meters was, was being a little bit too invasive. Maybe it's 150 meters. But in general, apart from this, this segment here, where one might find that they're, they're also more regular, we're very close to the envelope. But we're still only using the nearest neighbor distances. Uh, the innovation introduced by Brian Ripley in the early 70s was to say, well, we have computers now, so we can calculate all of the pair distances. In geostatistics, we use all of the pair distances. So here we use all of the pair distances. So use all of the pair distances and then uh, define bands stepping out from, from, uh, from, from, from that. Uh, usually you'd convert from the k-hat to the l-hat, which gives a flat distribution. So that if we're then, uh, if we're then uh, uh, running the e estimate of the k, k function, k-hat, and we're simulating here with the, uh, with the uh, completely, uh, completely spatially random um, distribution, so then what we're seeing here, and uh, the empirical line is brown, these are the observed ones, what we find is that there is indication of regularity at less than about 400 meters. But here we're looking at completely spatially random. And then, yes, we accept that it's completely spatially random from about 600 meters, we're definitely, the, the, the observed line is within the envelope. So it, it is completely spatially random from about five, 600 meters, definitely, not a problem. But before that, there's something going on which is not completely spatially random. So that then we can go back to using, uh, using SSI 
And then we're getting something which looks, looks like this, that we're not expecting to see any points initially. And then subsequently we're seeing uh, that we're close to the upper bound of completely spatially random, but maybe there's maybe there is an, in, an indication that at larger distances, something we couldn't find by looking at the uh, nearest neighbor distance, but which we can find by looking at all pairs of distances, that maybe the drumlins are slightly clustered once you get above about half a kilometer. Above that, then you get some parts of the area where, where, where they have many more, and some parts of the area where there are many fewer. This would be like looking at the, the density plot with a bandwidth of about half a kilometer. So there, there are obviously some parts of the area where the, where the dominants are clustered and other parts where they're more absent. So there appears to be clustering going on at above uh, 600 meters. But before that, then we, 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 can, we can probably accept that, that uh, SSI is, is, is a good fit, probably using not 180 meters, but using 150 meters. We could also, and this is a, a, a variant of, of the K-hat, uh, this is saying, okay, we believe that there is inherent inhomogeneity, like an unobserved, uh, unobserved covariate in, in, in the data. And this then gives us, uh, uh, gives us something like that. So that if we accept that there's inhomogeneity in the observations beyond about half a kilometer, then, 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 then for, for completely uh, spatially random, we're good. We would expect to see this here, that we're seeing many fewer at l uh, pairs of neighbors at less than, less than half a kilometer because here we're using completely spatially random and not next one. And here we're, we're almost there. We've more or less got the, all of the uh, observed inhomogeneous G hat, uh, K hat, here measured as an L hat, which is a function of the K hat, inside the envelope lines. So that possibly if we, if we change from 150 meters to 180 meters to 150 meters, maybe maybe there's some something here still here, but but the the idea with point process model modeling is to try to uh, work out which process model gives you a, a, a good fit to the observed uh, observed data. It's not to say as one would. Wednesday morning and Thursday. We've got spatial autocorrelation. This is a thing in itself. So we reify spatial uh, autocorrelation. What point process modeling is trying to do is saying, which theoretical point process model can generate uh, draws, or can, we're drawing from a theoretical model, and which of these matches the observed data best? For the same measure, and there are a number of other measures in addition to k hat and and, and g hat and so on. And the advantage about using k hat is because you're using all of the pairs of distances and not just the the the, the single pairs of, of, of distances. I have a question here. Yes. Um, I just was wondering about this difference between the spatial autocorrelation and uh, point pattern. But if you now would kind of use the covariate, like say the radius or the height. Yes. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah. The, not necessarily, but it, it's possible. It's it, the it, uh, one step from what we're doing here, which is just using the points, is to mark them. But then they're marked into classes, which is what we get to next. Uh, however, uh, the, there are also approaches through uh, point process modeling where one can associate covariates with the points. Uh, and this then becomes more complex, but it's doable, and SPATSTAT can do that too, so that, that we don't have uh, measurements of the heights of the, of the drumlins, but if we could register it properly now and download really high-resolution uh, high altitude data, you could read off uh, those heights. 
uh, where, where you would probably expect that the SSI bound on a higher drumlin should be larger and on a smaller drumlin should be smaller because it can't suppress neighbours. So if you've got a small drumlin or some small drumlins, then, then its neighbour can be a bit closer because it's not such a large drumlin. If one could uh, do a three-dimensional estimate of the volume of each of the drumlins, so that you'd take take the drumlin volume as being the distance to the inflection in the in in the uh, elevation, so that the drumlin would be a, a, a hump, and then you'd say you cut it off where the uh, where the um, slope goes to zero around it. So you'd define the slope going to zero, and then take the, the, the volume in that. That would probably be, explain quite a lot of the variability in the interdrumlin distances. Because a, a, a drumlin with a large volume obviously would push its neighbors away further. Uh, but the, this, this is then, then the class of PPMs rather than PPPs. Uh, but the but the, the the first elements the, the the one I'd like to to, to just to mention be, 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 before we before we conclude uh, is uh, case control and case control is then you have a marked point pattern where uh, you have cases and you have controls and uh, that was the, the classic approach it's been around for quite a long time uh, particularly when you were looking at at uh, incidences of diseases or um, in relation to a different um, disease, for which there might be different uh, different uh, um, propagation factors, that one might be assumed to, to spread in space, the other one would be assumed to be uh, uniform over the population. But because the population is inhomogeneous, then you you don't just want to look to try. Is this the the, the classic case of uh, 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 news media? and social media finding clusters of cases. So you find a cluster of cases of children who become ill in a housing estate. And the, the inhabitants and social media and everybody else says, ah, there must be something bad here. But it could be just random. And, and finding out this is sort of the, as if you ask people whether, whether the lottery machine draws uh, balls at random, they say, well, well, we probably believe it does because otherwise it wouldn't make much sense to have the lottery. But almost all lottery draws lead to two integers which are, uh, which are neighbors. Sometimes they get, you get a run of three. And this is, this is, this, and the machine has to be random, otherwise nobody, nobody would buy lottery tickets. So, so the, the, that even completely random sets of distributions can 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 appear to be clustered and people sort of look at them and they say oh there's too much of, of this this going on here the data set is from uh, Guichi in in China where I was contacted by by Zhang and co-authors in 2007 uh, where they needed some help in in implementing some methods, and the, the, these are then the clean data sets. There's a, a data set of points uh, for the for the um, um, distrib the, dist the, the cases are uh, observations of uh, uh, schistosomiasis in Guichi. Uh, the backstory is that uh, the health services in most of China had been very successful using uh, sort of very broad campaigns to eliminate the snails, which are the vector for for for, for this serious disease. Uh, they the, the, there's also been quite a lot of sort of World Bank World Health, World Health Organization engagement, and because the projects had been successful, so that the, the number of new cases uh, before the programs, the number of new cases was increasing, then the number it stabilized and it fell dramatically. So there were almost no new cases. However, when the program stopped and the treatments in, in, in the field uh, were rescinded, one or two new cases started appearing. 
and these are the cases which are reported in the study, where they were looking at, instead of doing blanket treatments, how could you do focus treatments which would take out the remaining, uh, remaining locations, um, uh, principally closeness to, to river bodies. So the, the, there are the points which include both the cases and then controls which are sampled at random from the population in the area. There are rivers because the, the, the uh, underlying assumption is that one would expect to find the uh, new, new cases uh, close to water bodies but without using any tests for closeness to the water bodies. The, the, there was some other... Uh, there was uh, other work. The, the paper. There are two papers, and they go much further than than, than what I'll do. So what we're doing here is is um, ingesting the points, the the polygon and the rivers. The polygon encloses the um, uh, the city boundaries, and uh, we have the distinction between the 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 cases, which are the the the, um, the circles, and the controls, which are the triangles. So what one's then interested in is whether the, the relative density of the cases and the controls, and there's also a cross uh, K-hat for, for, among other things, for, for dealing with. The controls were sampled from the population. So the cases are the, the, the specific location of the residences of the patients who'd, who'd been registered, new, newly registered, and the controls were simply so that if this was uh, something one would expect to occur in the population at large, so you sample a similar number from, from this. So you've got 166 uh, points in total, uh, and they have a, a, a mark. And the marks are the, the points mark, and that's to say whether you're a case or a control. And here we've got the multi-types, case and control. There are 83 of each, so there were 83 cases, so 83 uh, random locations, uh, uh, depending on population density, were, 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 were chosen. And in this case, what we were doing with the data was was um, um, to avoid the possibility that the uh, location of the uh, of the patients' residences could be identified in the paper. We also uh, can sort of flipped the data and changed its aspect, and so that so that it. It would be possible to guess where the houses are, but you, it would be extremely difficult, and there's, you, you're not getting any help from 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 the locations. So the locations are just in the unit square. Uh, so that if we say split the 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 the, 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 the PPP object, so that we then get plotting of the split object. So we're plotting the cases and the controls. Uh, and one can see that the controls appear to be uh, distributed. They're not e evenly distributed because the population in the city was not evenly distributed, but they're dis distributed aligned with the, the population density in the city as a whole, and the cases are, uh, are distributed where, where they were. So we could then run kernel density, and then running kernel density of the, uh, of the, uh, of the points uh, will give us uh, will give us um, uh, a, a picture of, of of what's going on. This is z. This is a density of the points. However, what we actually want to do is not look at the density of the points; is to look at the density of the cases and the controls. So again, we we had the, we pl plotted just the. plotted just the uh, the uh, uh, locations and now we're plotting the uh, the densities we can see that for the controls the density is fairly diffuse and for the cases the density is very clearly uh, here along the the northwestern edge if you look a little closer then then there's something else going on here it's an increased intensity in this location and it's also possible to plot a kernel ratio that's the ratio of one map to the other so that we can take the 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 the, the ratio the ratio is actually highest here but that's simply because there are very few inhabitants and there were very few points in the controls so the ratio of what's the intensity of the uh, of the case surface to the control surface there weren't many the, the, one, the, the density of the control surface was very low, so that there are 
so that this is this is this is a a, a kernel ratio uh, approach, uh, where the kernel ratio is, and this is then overplotted with 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 the points, here, and this is this is uh, this is just so we're sort of moving into the sort of out of town area. Obviously, if you were an urban planner, you would be concerned about this. But if you increase the number of controls in that area, then the kernel ratio would go down. However, there, there are there are cases in areas where the where like here, there are, there are one or two here in areas where there's quite high population density, and there are some locations where there's a control and a case uh, more or less co-located. So, so that that's a, that's another point pattern point pattern approach, contrasting to it's possible to go on and model from those and modeling also including a covariate is is demonstrated in 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 our book and in this the big space stat book where they where they go much 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 further uh, on knowing how to handle this. So that in in the in the uh, actual articles underlying this this just just glancing at the data. Uh, the kernel ratios we're using and then if you're using kernel ratios then you can randomize the allocation of labels to the cases and controls and see whether the observed uh, labeling matches the, the 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 so you you could look at this in terms of the of the relative distance between cases and controls in a situation where you're sampling from so if, if you do random labeling, then you can change the assignation of a case and control, and you can you can pick out from that whether the, the whether the cases appear to be be clustered. In this case, they do appear to be clustered, but the next step would be to go on and find out whether they are close to water bodies, or whether the areas which appear to have a, an over representation of cases compared to controls are close to water bodies. I didn't. I haven't heard back from them. It was once the articles came out, then then we haven't been in touch. So I don't know whether they were able to uh, put um, sort of reasonable budget uh, focused, sort of targeted, uh, targeted treatments in place to to reduce reduce the the, the problem. Uh, that is an overview, very, 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 very rapid overview of uh, of uh, geostatistics and point patterns. Uh, both of the approaches are um, valuable. There's a lot of work going on in both of them. In the case of geostatistics, then probably as much of the action occurs outside packages in R than in packages in R. And within packages in R, there are also choices that you can make between model-based and conventional geostatistics. In point patterns, very much more, a, a larger proportion of uh, the work by uh, academic statisticians in point process modeling is done using R packages. So that, that R packages, in particular, uh, SPATSTAT, uh, now contains most of the available techniques uh, which which could be used so that you can rely on uh, SPATSTAT to give you a good coverage of what's going on. But in geostatistics, you can't really say the same about any of the packages. And the different package authors, whether it's SP Bayes, uh, GSTAT, uh, GOR, Fields, um, there's another package called Random Fields for generating um, uh, synthetic views of, of Gaussian random fields. Mileage may vary, and then you can step completely outside that and go to INLA, which also fits geostatistical models uh, excellently, but does it without the joint posterior, which SP Bayes would be more concerned with. Then you can go to spatiotemporal geostatistics, which is a whole new game, and the uh, the book by uh, Wickler and Cressy uh, is as thick as this is spatiotemporal uh, uh, statistics for spatiotemporal data is as thick as the original Cressy uh, uh, statistics for spatial data. And then this year a book has come out on, uh, on uh, statistics for spatiotemporal data with R uh, with Andrew Manjon. 
um, Zamit Manjom as, as a co-author who did most of the R implementations. So that for, for the modern, uh, modern uh, geostatistical takes such as fixed rank creaking and things like that, there are packages in R. But the variability of where packages are is is uh, is um, varies enormously. Um, before I turn off, then I'll I'll draw attention to to one comparative paper and its references to uh, to other comparative papers. So this is E B K. Um, and see if this so I'm not, it's evaluation of empirical Bayesian Krieging, which is a paper in special statistics which came out in 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 July uh, this uh, in July this year. And if we go to the references, it's also using a com uh, a comparative study. Uh, there's a fairly good coverage here of, of the literature. Uh, and this paper uh, by Heaton et al. is a, a case study competition among methods for analyzing large spatial data. So the Heaton paper gives you everything except sort of comparative methods for everything except em empirical Bayesian Krieging. And this paper gives you the comparison between fixed strength Krieging and, and uh, lattice Krieging and some of the methods like that. And I th think Inla, but I'm not sure. Uh, Inla is included in, as you can see, that Finn Lindgren is included in, in the authors here of Heaton et al. So this article is, is, uh, is a useful overview of uh, the artillery, the geostatistical artillery, with the exception of empirical Bayesian Krieging. And this article the article which which I pulled up here from Spatial Statistics from from July this year uh, gives you the comparative uh, uh, contribution of empirical Bayesian Krieging in that setting. So running running empirical Bayesian Krieging on the same test data set that was used by uh, by Heaton et al. And which I think is is so that's informative. So that if you look at Heaton et al. and then uh, Krivorochko and Gribov 2019, you get a, an overview of, of uh, what status is now in, in geostatistics. Okay, so we'll conclude at that point, and I have to leave for other obligations.